obviously, to the film, Mr. Davey Pena and James, the amazing Randy. So I'm sure you have a million questions, um, most of them directed at Mr. Randy. I can open them up to anyone. Anyone have any questions for me or anyone on the stage? Yes, sir. Uh, I don't have a question. I'd just like to thank you for being a huge inspiration to uh, everyone here in the audience and for everyone who will see this movie in the years to come. So thank you. Very much. I was curious what you said to Yuri Geller to get him to appear on film. Uh, you know, uh, when we contacted Yuri Geller, he asked how we got Yuri Geller to appear on film. Um, the quick answer to that is, the most dangerous place to be is between you, a camera, and Yuri Geller. <laughs> <laughs> so at first he said, his lawyer said, well, you know, Randy and him have a very litigious relationship, it's very rocky, we want to know the question to every, or the answers that you're going to ask him. And we started writing up the answers, and then we said, you know what, look at this. And we called up Yuri, and he said, we don't really need you in the film. We don't. It's okay if you're not in it. Come on out, come out, come out. Needless to say, he's actually a very charming man. Um, yes, he's very charming. Uh, he's very kind, and he can bend spoons with his mouth. Which he did for us. He actually did it. We told him. Like The first thing we told him is we said, look, we don't believe what you do. I'm sorry. We need to get that out of the way first. We don't, we don't believe what you do. We appreciate how you do it. And, and then at the end of the day, after the interview, he had a, uh, this big, huge house in, in, in England. And he has shrubs and hedges in the form of bent spoons. <laughs> and he had this big, massive pile of spoons and forks in his backyard, surrounded by a crystal about this large. And he goes, now don't be skeptical. And he reached out, and he picked up a spoon, and he bent it with his mouth. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, is uh, Kreskin still alive? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes, Kreskin is very much alive. He's he's got a, a different aspect to his business now. He used to have a TV series done in Canada, yeah. you may remember some years ago. But now, don't ask me why. I really can't explain this. He's now selling methods for winning the lottery. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Hold on now. If you had a system for beating the lottery, wouldn't you do it? Rather <laughs> than sell it? I mean, let's get logical someplace along the line here. Yes, he's, he's still in business. Next question? Yes, sir. I read that when you exposed Pop Off, you first went to the California authorities. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about that story? If it's true? To the California authorities. Authorities? No, not to the authorities. Not until afterwards. I tried to get them to do something about it. But uh, no, they, they say, oh, that's, that's God stuff. We don't touch God stuff. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but but no, no, we didn't really go to the authorities, but we had to get uh, permission to do various things along the way or we're invading people's privacy. But his were open meetings and we had completely free access to them. As a matter of fact, in one of the shots on the screen there, I was actually sitting in the audience with a white wig on and uh, very heavy glasses and, and contact lenses. I was actually sitting in the audience. I show up very small on the screen, though. We went everywhere to try to get someone interested in this. The New York Times, uh, uh, America, you know, all the morning shows in New York, 2020, everybody. And everybody turned us down, saying, well, you know, we don't have time this week. We're busy on our schedule, and we don't really, we don't really want to do religious stuff. So they had every excuse in the world. And we did go to the U.S. Attorney, we had lunch with the U.S. Attorney uh, for San Francisco. And I wasn't part of that, though. You were, you oh, were taking care of okay, that. Okay, that's yeah. true. And we gave him this, and you know, he listened to it, and he said, well, you know, I think it's despicable, but there's really nothing against the law that he did. But we tried everywhere to get publicity, because I thought this is going to be dynamite. And then you pulled your ace in the hole, card up your sleeve, and called Johnny Carson. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I, I remember with that, uh, Mr. de Cordova, who was his producer, 
I went in and I presented this to him, and he said, oh, wow. Oh, wow, we'll do this tonight. <laughs> and the secretary said, well, we've got so many people on tonight. Yeah, they can wait. <laughs> so uh, they canceled a couple of people off the program that night. They were not big stars or anything like that, but uh, they made room for us. And uh, when the program was finished, <laughs> the, the audience starts to leave this huge, huge theater, of course. And uh, I wandered over to the head table there, and there was uh, Fred DeCarta with the producer and Johnny Carson. And uh, I, I just got there in time to hear DeCarta was saying to John, we're going to get letters. <laughs> <laughs> and John looked up very calmly at Fred and said, yes, Fred, and you're going to answer them. <laughs> and they got letters. They got a storm of mail after that. It was very exciting for them and for us. Yes. In the film, um, Geller is very eloquent about how the woo movement has grown dramatically. Yep. Now, the skeptical movement has also grown dramatically. Yes. yes. But I kind of want to get your take on how we're doing with winning that war. Well, we've got the Grand Randy Educational Foundation going for us and have for, for many years now. And every year, as a matter of fact, in a couple of weeks, uh, yeah. I think three weeks or so, we'll be in Las Vegas doing the amazing meeting, TAM we call it, and uh, we do that every year, and it, it's not only uh, a good agent to meet a lot of people, we had uh, over 1,200 people at the last one, we have to build our own casino next time, uh, but you know, it's very encouraging and it gets people very, very familiar with what we do, and we always get very good press coverage as well. So. Uh, the Jane Friday Education Foundation is in there very strongly. And we've got people all over this country and in Europe as well who tip us off to various things that we need to know about. And uh, I've got my 11th book coming out. I'm sure you're all anxious to buy a copy. <laughs> uh, that will be out in, in a matter of a few months uh, according to our plans. And that will cover a lot of stuff that has happened over the years since I was really very accurate. I, I've had medical problems, uh, uh, serious medical problems, but uh, I went to a, what was the name of it? Oh yeah, medical science. <laughs> and some of you may have heard of it, and I highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, it's back there. Has anyone seen the million dollar prize for proving they are an authentic psychic? Has anybody? Oh, you betcha. <laughs> we get mail all the time on this sort of thing. We ask that they send in uh, a letter and explain, and not more than they can be long, two paragraphs, because otherwise they write 40 pages uh, in, hand, in cribbed handwriting that we can't read at all. But it needs to be typed. It needs to be a claim that can be fitted into two large paragraphs as to what they can actually do under what conditions, and they have to notarize it and send it into us. We get them all the time. They're not notarized. They're six paragraphs. We have to send them back to two paragraphs, read this, read this, and such, and then they eventually will get back to us. In some cases, but only in about 20 or 30 percent of the cases. Otherwise, we don't hear from them again at all. And we, we do test them at the amazing meeting that we hold every year if they subject themselves to a test. And so far, can you believe it? No one has won the million dollars. Yes, Why are people so willing to believe these self-proclaimed psychics? Well, uh, Jamie and Swiss said it on the screen there. Uh, it, it, it's just a quick comment that he made, but he certainly meant it very, uh, very soundly. They need magic answers. They're not satisfied with what they're hearing, but the media will promise them all kinds of things. The media is largely, I must say, it's unkind perhaps, but the media is largely responsible for the fame that people like Geller still enjoy and that all of the other psychics do as well because they see a great story. They just run into the editor. we got a guy here who can do so and so. Oh yeah, print it. They, they don't care whether it's true or not. They should, they should have some integrity in the matter, but media integrity is something that's often very hard to find. Any of the same things that Randy has, or do you have an uh, idea of actually maybe doing a Yuri Geller? 
<laughs> so, uh, we, we, we call that, uh, well, we refer to Randy's term woo-woo, or we call it oogie-boogie. <laughs> and one of the problems for us in, in tackling it is uh, the structure of the show, one of the structures of the show is that we don't bring people on to make fools of them. Now that's, you know, I, I have a personal feeling about that, but that's just the structure of the show as it's grown. Um, we've long had an episode about dowsing, but there's no way to test it without bringing someone on to make them feel like a fool. Actually, they wouldn't feel like a fool. <laughs> but we'd end up, we'd end up showing them, showing them up, showing them as idiots. I guess is the technical term. <laughs> um, one of the the other problems is is that we can't. We're, we're not in the business of trying to prove a negative. If we go look for Bigfoot or the Loch Ness monster, all we've proven is that we don't know how to find it. Uh, and so many of these claims are so ludicrous, the only way to properly test them is, is the rigorous protocols of the Million Dollar Challenge that Randy's, you know, outlined countless times and used countless times. Uh, and it's a, di it's a different show than Mythbusters. Uh, we're always looking for a control to compare something against. And if you can't blow it up, you don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. What's happening next? Oh, what's happening next? What's next? I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've, well, we've got the next time coming up, as I said, and that's good. taking all of our attention right now. Uh, but I have my 11th book, uh, uh, Well Formation, and we're just putting the illustrations into it now, and that'll be out, and I'm sure you'll all look for it. It's going to be called, um, what, what's the name of it? <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> Just testing him, you see. A magician in the laboratory. And I, I can assure you it's going to be a very interesting book covering a lot of uh, what has been happening in the last few years. And lots has been happening. So look forward to it, will you? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, in, in my own life, I've replaced sort of a, 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 a the wonder that I felt for the things I didn't understand and that I at one point thought about religion and mysticism and other things. And I replaced that with this really amazing love of science and, and the getting my wonder itch scratched that way. And I think that the work that you have done and the work like uh, some of the stuff Penn and Teller has done and on, on Mythbusters has been these amazing things that you have done to help us replace this very human desire for wonder and to, to fill these questions with something, with, with something substantial. And I, as an individual who doesn't have a, a television show or books or, or other things, I, I struggle almost on a daily basis trying to think of what concrete things we can do to help other people find all of this. Well, and if, are, there, are there things you'd like for us to be doing more of? Oh, yes. I would like you to look. look the, the internet is a wonderful source of information. Not always correct, but in most cases <laughs> very much uh, in that direction. Look up the James Randi Educational Foundation, J-R-E-F. See what you can do. You would like, like to join us in our efforts, and there are ways of doing that. If you have any expertise, we'd certainly like to make use of that as well, because I find all kinds of people out there who don't realize that they actually have expertise in some fields that can be used. Uh, what he means by GREF is randy.org, R-A-N-D-I. <laughs> uh, growing, growing up, uh, how did your family uh, support your career? Well, no, they, they didn't. Uh, I left home at a very early age. I was one of three kids. I was the oldest of, of three kids. And uh, I left and joined a carnival somewhere along the line there. And, uh, I learned an awful lot. I learned how to stay dry when the tent had fallen on us and it was raining. A few interesting things like that. But I got into show business uh, very early on. At about the age of 17, I was actually uh, involved in it. And uh, that's, that's where I had all the, the real rough stuff. The, the latest stuff is not as rough as that was, I can assure you. She asked, how did he do the spoon trick? Well, and I can describe that to you truthfully in, in just this phrase. You do it when no one's looking. That's literally what you do. Now, Mr. Geller, for example, would you hold the microphone just for a moment? Over here. <laughs> 
trying to train him, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mr. Geller, now, I'm 85 years of age. I swear that if you gave me maybe 20 spoons to hold in one hand, I could probably do that without suffering any dislocations of my limbs or anything like that. But Mr. Geller, when he picks up one spoon off the table, has to pick it up in both hands and then turn away and say, come over here. That's all that happens. And he conceals the bend with his other hand as he turns back to face you, and then slowly lets it hang over the side of his hand. It's that simple. You do it when nobody's looking. That is the entire secret of how to do the spoon test. You know, one of the early interviews we did was with Adam Savage, and then we came back and did another one. And he said something very important. He, in fact, he was the first interview uh, of the film that we did, and then we came back. We discarded that and did another one. Um, but he said, if you really have these tricks, if you really have these psychic abilities to affect movement and change molecular structure and read people's minds, and you're bending spoons, <laughs> you know, it's just, he said, and you're doing parlor tricks? Really? I got that from Ray. We have two more questions. Yes, sir. Uh, what about, uh, this, and this is not strictly psychic phenomena, but an intermediate phenomena of uh, autonomic uh, systems control of it, like raising the heat. Has there ever, anything to that? Have you ever investigated that? So it's not strictly psychic, but the ability to, let's say, ra raise the, your bodily heat. Voluntary. Oh yes, well these are these are some physiological things that some people can do. Now I, I see uh, accounts all the time of, of uh, shamans in Tibet in the mountains in the Himalayas, uh, where you wet a blanket and throw it over their shoulders, and the blanket dries off. <laughs> At high altitudes in the mountain, a hot body and a cold blanket. And it dries off. It takes a couple hours to work, but it does work. And some people are so astonished by that. It got dry. What is it going to get wetter? <laughs> Last question. Who's the lucky one? There, there, there. Yes, you. For the editor, your favorite scene that you couldn't put in there. What a great question. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to cue this one up for you because the whole Alpha project is filled with favorite scenes that couldn't be in the film. And thankfully, there's talk of a narrative version of the Alpha project. Right. Um, there was so much within this film. There were so many stories from Randy, there were so many stories from the past, there were things that were ha what happened. But the Alpha project was full of comedy and suspense and intrigue and deceit and and romance and lies and trickery and um, the, 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 the pop-off. I mean, he told this story about uh, having to sneak in and um, having how he went in, Alec Jason went in and almost was caught and had to pretend he was a, um, a security guard and then he was wrangled into uh, you know, moving people around. I mean, it's like all the stories. Oh, yeah, and that actually might be the scene that I heard most to cut. Yeah, that was one of the last things to go. Uh, he recorded the, the uh, cassette tape of the recording, and then he put it in his tape player. Let, let him tell oh, Yeah, you tell the story. So after, after he recorded this, uh, this monumental moment of Alec, uh, of Pop Off, the secret tape. Yeah, the tape of the intercepted audio. You know, you remember the NSA? I was doing it. <laughs> um, I had this tape, it was on a cassette tape, and I had the proof then that we were looking for. There was no question. And I was all alone, I got back in my car, and I wanted to make sure that the tape was, that it had it on the tape. So I put it in my cassette tape player, you know, those things with the, with the radio, <laughs> you know, the ground thing. <laughs> Pushed the button, the play button, and then it didn't work. And I hit the rewind, and I hit the play, and then I don't know what happened. I put the eject, and out came the tape. <laughs> and let me tell you, I thought, how am I going to explain this to Randy? He was waiting for me.
and I was really panicked. And actually, we got back, I don't know, Randy, if you remember this, but we got back to our little meeting house, and everybody was there, and this other fellow who was with us had reported, oh, Alan got the whole thing, he got the whole thing. So I show up late because I've been trying to fix this thing. And uh, everyone's cheering, oh, we heard you got it, oh, it's great, it's great. And I'll say, yeah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I took Randy, I don't know if you remember this, I said, I only talk to you now. I said, uh, I'm in a separate room, I said, there's a little problem here. Uh, look at the tape. And I said, mm. <laughs> uh, get a screwdriver. So we had a little screwdriver, and he put it all back together. We a little piece of scotch tape on there, and we went out there and played. And no one knew. James, Randy, uh, would you want to say something? Yeah. Um, I just want to say that in uh, the early 90s, the uh, gay was a pathology in the United States. In Venezuela, it was a death sentence. Um, if we would have been a straight couple, none of this would have happened. And, um, and I feel that no group of people should be forced to make such untenable choices simply out of uh, prejudice or uh, fear or ignorance and uh, just to be together or um, to to establish a life together. Um, 30 years later, we're still debating whether we have the right to have marriage equality. And I think it's just a fundamental human right. And that uh, we hope that the film also provides a platform to talk about these issues and move it along. And uh, people do not have to go through the pain that, that, that a lot of um, uh, people have gone through.